the warning signs should have been flashing red and SVB should have stood out as what it was. Absolutely a problem child. In many ways, it's similar to what we saw um, in past crises, panics. There's a mix of managerial incompetence by banks, but also places where the regulations may not have been where they needed to be, and the regulators not always taking the steps they need to do it. We're obviously doing a review to see what went wrong. Hello, and welcome to Washington Post Live. My name is Lori Montgomery, and I'm the business editor here at The Post. My guest today is Rohit Chopra, the director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Hi, how are you doing today? Welcome to The Post. Thanks for having me, Lori. Well, so, Mr. Director, your job is to protect consumers from bad behavior by financial institutions. Uh, we just obviously heard about some bad behavior. The failure of SVB Bank was the second largest in U.S. history. Why did that bank fail and how much blame should we lay at the feet of regulators? Well, there is no question that there was certain types of culture in boardrooms and approaches to banking that were unsafe and unsound. You had in the case of Silicon Valley Bank um, a lot of fast growth, a lot of uninsured depositors, and really a very different type of business model, especially when it comes to tying of deposit accounts and loans. And Lori, there is no question that some of the deregulation in recent history helped to contribute to it. And there are clearly some major changes that will need not just by on the regulations, but also on how the regulators supervise some of these firms. The CFPB was actually created out of the ashes of the last financial crisis, where it was very clear that regulations and regulators were not where they needed to be. So to what extent do you think that, that you're referring, of course, to Dodd-Frank, which was passed in 2010, I believe, after the, the last financial crisis. And then some of those regulations were dialed back uh, during the Trump administration. To what extent did that decision to dial back regulations, especially as they would apply to a mid-sized bank like SVB, to what extent did that contribute to this situation? Well, I think there was a fundamental premise that was wrong in some of the deregulation by the Federal Reserve and other regulators. I think they basically thought that some of these banks were small. You know, a hundred billion dollar, two hundred billion dollar bank. We now have a clear fact from last month that it could have caused real wreckage in the banking system and the economy. And this is not a community bank. This is a domestic, systemically important bank, and it needs to be appropriately and robustly regulated and supervised. So what happened several years ago was that threshold was increased and the Federal Reserve and others really undermined some of the four ways in which we make sure that these firms have enough cash on hand, can meet depositor demands, that they have enough skin in the game. And it's clear that a lot of that was a mistake. So we will need to take steps to undo that. We also need to look, Lori, at the rules that were never implemented in the first place, such as the 2010s law 
provisions on looking at executive compensation. There's been a lot of questions we're all getting about what role some of the bonuses and stock options, how they played in. And, you know, people are wondering, are some of the executives of these failed banks able to run away with a big payout or will they ultimately be held accountable? So there's old rules that need to make sure they see the light of day. And we also need to fix some of the problems that were created in recent years. So let's talk about executive compensation. So uh, the House actually passed on a bipartisan basis uh, as part of the Dodd-Frank legislation, um, uh, a, a, an ability to go after executive compensation when banks fail. Um, the Biden administration has urged there to be a clawback in the situation of SBB, where the CEO, I believe, made nearly $10 billion last year alone and sold more than three million dollars worth of stock a few weeks before the bank failed. Um, the Senate, at least, is looking at legislation. What what should happen? How, sh how should this play out, in your opinion? Well, I don't want to specifically comment on um, the executives of any particular firm. I do think we should look at all of our existing legal authorities where there was law violations um, to go after individuals. Individual accountability is so critically important. Um, when it comes to the financial system, we've learned that time and again. But you're right, there's also some provisions of law that allow the regulators to really kick the tires on executive comp. We can't have a system where executives can take huge risks that blow up years down the road, but can pocket big sums of money and stock options, um, and they can fly the coop before the damage um, wrecks the bank. So there's lots of ways to do this. There can be restrictions on the form of executive compensation, including stock options. There can be more requirements on deferring some of that compensation so that if things do blow up, um, those executives won't get the money. So we, we've got to really um, see how we make sure we align the incentives of those executives. Um, and it's really going to be important to implement those provisions of law. And you're saying that that exists in current law, not that we don't need additional legislation, or am I misunderstanding you? Oh, it's, a, it's sitting there in the law and the regulators just have to implement it. One of the things that we see across the financial regulators, when I took office at the CFPB a year and a half ago, there were so many legal authorities that Congress had already enacted, but were not implemented. We are really focusing on these dormant provisions of law and making sure that we are realizing the benefits of what Congress put that work into. So in many ways, yes, there will probably be places, maybe deposit insurance where Congress needs to act, but a lot of this is about regulators getting to work and enforcing and administering the law as Congress won. Okay, uh, well, I wanted to talk a minute about federal deposit insurance. Um, in fact, we have a viewer question uh, about that topic from Lewis Spector uh, of Virginia. He asks, why did the FDIC agree to back all of Silicon Valley's bank, the Silicon Valley Bank's depositors, removing the risk for all uninsured depositors? Can you address that? Well, the boards of the FDIC uh, and the Federal Reserve unanimously recommended to the Treasury Secretary to take an extraordinary measure which is, and, and guarantee the uninsured depositors of both Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. After Silicon Valley Bank had failed, um, we immediately started seeing um, major flows of uninsured deposits throughout the banking system. And there was a real concern and a credible threat that there could be a cascading effect on other banks that could fail, um, we, we really saw that a bank of that size, 
even if it was just 100 or $200 billion, really could threaten um, the stability of the financial system. We are now working, uh, and the FDIC chairman has stated that we'll be looking about how we build the costs of this to the financial industry. Um, he has mentioned that we will look at targeting the costs and the assessment of those costs on the financial institutions that most benefited from it. And you can stay tuned to hear more on that. But it certainly was um, a difficult decision, uh, but it was one that really put into focus the places where our regulatory system has made some fundamental errors of judgment, like thinking that a $100 billion bank could not cause real harm to the whole economy if it failed. That decision was unprecedented. What, how can we think about this in a way that, I mean, are all deposits effectively insured at this point? Would we ever not uh, take this action, if you understand what I'm asking? Yeah, well, the law tells us that we have to make this on a case-by-case -case basis. And I think it has rightfully invited questions about the deposit insurance framework. You know, right now, for the ver these very large banks, if the market and depositors believe that they get free unlimited insurance, that's not really fair to the smallest banks where there might not be that perception. Now, obviously, we want to assure everybody that their money is secure. We are laser focused. Every regulator, I'm most focused on consumers, but all the regulators are looking at making sure the system is safe. But it is true. There is um, a need to look at the deposit insurance framework. Last year, we even saw how certain crypto firms might have been misrepresenting um, that their, their funds were insured. Obviously, that wasn't true. We've taken some steps to address that. There's a lot of questions from businesses who, let's say, uh, have a lot of payroll um, that might exceed the current deposit insurance limits. They, they want to know what's an easy way for them to manage that. There's a lot of proposals. The FDIC is going to be preparing a report on this. I personally think that there may be a place where we can give um, higher limits that banks would pay for in insurance premiums for these types of payroll accounts um, so that small businesses, other businesses can, can keep their money safely and really make sure, I think it maybe should be tailored to non-interest bearing accounts that are really for these payroll-like um, accounts. What we saw and what we're learning from Silicon Valley Bank and others is that there was all sorts of unusual arrangements um, where you know you got venture funding, you also put your funds in that bank. We've got to look at it in the totality. And I really wonder whether the smallest banks or at least the ones that are not gigantic, we may even want to think of having different rules for them where maybe they can accept some of these higher insurance coverages because when they fail, it's a lot easier to contain the damage to the rest of the economy. And often um, the impacts on consumers and businesses is much more limited and much more manageable. So we may want to think hard about whether there should be different insurance limits for those payroll accounts that are in. Um, not that are in smaller banks. Yeah, that's interesting. So does that suggest, I mean, uh, Elizabeth Warren, who obviously is on the Senate Banking Committee, has, has talked about um, it permanently increasing the limits up to as much as $10 million uh, for all accounts. But you're describing something a much, that would take a much more tailored approach. Yeah, I think we want to wait to see what the FDIC's report lays out. I, I do think this, I think it, again, it's a little bit unfair if some banks, the biggest ones, if it feels like they're getting free insurance for big limits. Yeah. So I think there's a very good argument that if we're going to be insuring it, people should pay for it. 
And when I say people, I mean bank managers should pay for it if they're getting that insurance. So I, I'm really open to thinking through the various options, but this will require, of course, Congress to act. This is one of those issues that the regulators won't be able to do on their own. You raised the, the question of security, and obviously that's a, a huge issue on people's minds after these bank failures. It wasn't just SBB, obviously. There were a couple of others that went down and a, and a Credit Suisse uh, bailed out in, in Switzerland. So the, I guess the question is, um, if you're sitting at home wondering, I've only got deposit insurance up to $250,000. I don't know how many people need deposit interest that high. Nonetheless, the question is, like, is the banking system safe? Like, how should we think about uh, the health of the banking system right now? Yeah, right now, we have a lot of families across the country um, querying and searching on the CFPB website about deposit insurance. Uh, nearly every family in America has less than the deposit insurance limit. And even those that have a little more, including some of our nation's seniors, they are able in many ways to get additional insurance by having joint accounts, others. So I think for the vast majority of American families, um, I know that many are worried, but their funds are safe. I do think though that, as I mentioned before, there are certain types of accounts um, even including in Main Street businesses where they want to know where should they be keeping their funds, nonprofit organizations, others. We have seen a huge flow of deposits out of the banking system in the last several weeks to money market funds and other types of investment vehicles. In some ways, we want to give everybody a sense of how to make sure that their money is safe. Um, we saw in the blow up of FTX, a lot of people um, losing quite a bit of money and thinking that those funds were secure. And I think it, it behooves the regulators and all of us to make sure we're doing everything we can so that families and local businesses do not suffer. Does it feel like... Um... Does it feel like the moment has passed or are there other banks that are on the radar as sources of concern? You know, I like to take the view that our financial system, and we've learned this from the banking panics over the last century, you know, runs can happen. Um, and we want to make sure that banks can withstand them. That means banks need to have some real skin in the game. Their shareholders have to have a good amount of capital that that can be drawn on in a time of stress. We need to make sure that they're liquid and that they don't have you and don't have to engage in fire sales. So it's clear that it's not just about deposit insurance, it's also about making sure that we are managing the risks that can, in some ways, um, can be unpredictable. COVID, obviously, was not something that people could easily plan for. We now know with faster digital communication, we know with state and non-state actor interference, there can be lots of ways in which information or wrong information can travel quickly. And we have to set the regulatory system up appropriately. I'm very worried. And I don't have any concerns that it could happen at any moment. But I think a lot of people are storing money in peer-to-peer -peer apps and online payment systems. You know, apps like Cash App and Venmo, PayPal have become part of the digital wallets of so many Americans, but many may not know that those, whether those funds are insured or not, I would not want to see um, a run where people could not get their money. So I think as we see more digital currencies, we see a potential of stable coins and other money-like instruments. We as the regulators have to stay ahead of the game because we want families and businesses to know that their money is secure. Um, 
from attacks, from runs and instability. Well, that's one of the things I wanted to ask about SVB. I mean, one of the reasons that that run was so devastating is because um, we do live in a digital world. There was panic on social media. Um, there were calls to get out now while you can. And people were able to, with the touch of a button, make withdrawals almost instantaneously. The result being that $42 billion were, was attempted to be withdrawn from that bank in a single day. We've, we've never seen anything like that. How does any bank withstand a run like that? Well, I think this is in some ways uh, a reality that we can't fully stop when it comes to the fast moves of communications and actions. We already have so many ways that people can transfer money. We have real-time payments, and that's only going to accelerate. One of the things the CFPB will be proposing later this year is rules that will accelerate the move to open banking in the US, making, I hope, switching of products more seamless. We're seeing this all over the world, and that has real implications for how we ensure that banks and other institutions are liquid and have skin in the game. And you know, I do think, Lori, that with the right oversight, they would be able to withstand those demands. But of course, I don't think there's a way to put the genie back in the bottle when it comes to 24 seven fast communication. It's a reality we must accept and incorporate accordingly. Yeah, I want to go back to what you were just saying about uh, Venmo. Um, so people are storing money in these apps. Talk a little bit more about the risk you described. Well, so one of the things that people have long used in our country, and 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 it's used, you know, every day, is what's called money transmitters. Often we think of it as sending money, um, you know overseas, an, an international remittance. But many of these companies that are registered as, remit, as money transfer services, they are actually peer-to-peer -peer apps. Uh, they're growing in popularity and especially during the pandemic experienced more growth. And many people have downloaded these apps on their phones to not just pay their friends, but also to make other purchases. It's often, but not always, connected to their bank account. And instead of just moving money from place to place, a lot of customers have balances. People can look at their app for their PayPal or Venmo or Cash App balance. And many people think of this as, it's like a bank account. It's a place I can store funds. But the reality is it's not like a traditional bank account. And there are certain circumstances where those balances may not be fully insured. One of the things that the CFPB did uh, over a year ago is we ordered a whole set of information from the big tech companies like Apple Pay and Google Pay, as well as these big P2P payment providers about all sorts of issues, about data, about how they kick people off their system. But we're also really interested in fraud and the safety and security of those funds. I have argued that we may need to think when it comes to digital payments and currency of looking at an old provision of law that was also passed in 2010 that would allow the regulators to designate certain payment systems as potentially systemic, which would allow us to make sure they are safe and sound and protecting consumers. So I generally advise consumers not to keep too much money in these accounts, to, to move it to your bank account. Um, you can always use it to pay later, but I really want to make sure that, especially as people from all walks of life including some of the lowest income and paycheck to paycheck families, that they know their money is secure, even in the digital world. You were referring earlier to um, 
uh, the the need to recognize problems uh, in advance. One of the things I have been trying to understand about the SPB collapse is that it was under supervision and the Fed Federal, Federal Reserve officials repeatedly called out problems in that bank. Why didn't anything happen? Well, I'm going to let the Fed in its report speak more to that, but I will share this. I think it is time to really take a, a clearer look and in some ways create more automatic triggers to slow down some risky activity. I mean, come on, this bank had an enormous amount of uninsured depositors and uninsured depo depositors might be quick to flee. Um, so we need to think about, should there be some guardrails or even caps on uninsured deposits that are bright lines? Should there be some automatic triggers on growth restrictions when companies cross certain lines? A big focus for the CFPB is repeat offenders. We see a number of financial institutions repeatedly breaking the law, Wells Fargo, others. It can't just be waiting years down the line and you know doing a fine. We need to look at where are the speed bumps to stop some of the bad bad practices and to really slow down some of the dramatic growth when there's some obvious indicias of risk. So I think this is going to push all of the regulators to really up the game when it comes to this type of oversight because the consequences of acting too late can be very, very high. We often think about, there's a lot of conversation about the costs of regulating. I sometimes think we have to balance that with what are the costs of inaction. You've been very aggressive about um, arguing that there are authorities and powers in existent law that you can make use of to protect consumers. You mentioned uh, the, the P2P money apps as one risk. What other areas are you looking at? What well, other areas do we can be concerned about? Across the board, we really think at the CFPB that technology and the future of consumer finance, we really are in the moment of trying to make sure with the public, with policymakers, with the industry, how do we want to make sure that that future is in line with our values? So I talked a bit about how do we make sure we have an open banking system that's fair and not just dominated by, say, big tech firms and the very biggest banks. We're looking hard at these non-bank companies who are often not supervised in the same way, giving the same level of protection. And we've taken some steps to make sure we're gaining oversight into some of them. Relationship banking. We see that digitization can sometimes undermine relationship banking that, that stymies a consumer from getting answers to basic questions. We're looking at algorithmic bias and using existing authorities to make sure in appraisals and in the mortgage market, people are not dealing with a biased algorithm. So I think the future is in many ways very, very promising, but every single day, families are learning about new ways artificial intelligence is being used, how their data is being harvested. And I think the answer should not just be to sit and watch from the sidelines, but it's to make sure that existing law is being enforced and that we are allowing small businesses and startups to fairly compete and offer better products and services. I think it would be a big mistake for the U.S. to just copy, you know, how China's financial system dominated in many ways by WeChat Pay, Alipay when it comes to payments. We need to make sure we have relationship banking even as digitization accelerates. Okay, well, 
that's a fascinating area, and we'll look forward to hearing more from you on that. But we're going to have to leave it there. We're out of time. Rohit Chopra, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Lori. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Uh, please go to WashingtonPostLive.com to see about upcoming interviews, to find out more information about what we have for you in store. I'm Lori Montgomery, and thanks again for being here.